Howdy. Today we're going to talk about Neumann's principle. And this is basically a rule that relates the symmetry of a structure, for example, a crystal structure, to the symmetry of the properties of that material. So to, to give an example of what I mean, let's think about a cubic lattice for a second. Uh, and let's ask ourselves, how does that lattice behave if we apply um, some stress to it? And if we're in the elastic regime, we know that the stress should be linearly uh, proportional to the resulting strain through a constant that we call the elastic modulus. Um, but because this lattice is cubic, if I pull the thing horizontally, I would expect it to behave the same as if I rotated it and pulled it uh, what was before vertically, but what now is horizontally. Um, and this, this kind of makes common sense because uh, because of the symmetry of the structure, uh, you would expect that it would behave the same way to some applied load, for example, stress, um, based on uh, the direction that we're pulling that load. And so that is what Neumann's principle is all about. Um, so if we want to state it cleanly, basically the symmetry of a material's properties are at least as high as the symmetry of the material. Um, so if you think back to the example that we just talked about, the symmetry of the material was cubic. So the structure, um, it had a fourfold rotation axis coming out of the board, for example. Uh, and that means that the symmetry of the material's properties, like the elastic modulus or some other property we're interested in, should also be at least cubic. So it should have that same um, relationship um, based on uh, the orientation that we're applying uh, the load on. Um, so there are a couple corollaries, a couple of reasons why this is important. First of all, um, it, it means that the symmetry of the structure is going to limit how the properties of a material uh, vary in different directions. So for example, if I take that cubic structure and I measure it along lattice vector one and lattice vector two and lattice vector three, I would expect to get the same measurement uh, in all three directions. And so this is important because this means that we don't have to measure every single possible direction we can think of inside of a system. If we know something about the symmetry, it, it can limit how many different measurements we need to take. Um, so the second corollary is basically a different way to say the same thing. Properties along some direction or plane are equal along all directions or planes in that family. So we talked about families before. A family is a set of crystallographically um, equivalent directions or planes. Uh, and so going back to my example, if I measure the elastic modulus along the 100 direction, I would expect that it would be the same along the 010 or the 001, because these are all um, in the same family of directions for a cubic structure. Um, so to really fully understand Neumann's principle, um, we need to talk about some uh, definitions first. That's what we're going to do in this video. Then we need to basically do a little bit of math to derive where it's coming from. That'll be the second video. And then finally, we'll give some application uh, examples of how you apply this to a problem. That'll be a separate video. Um, and again, the, the way to think about it is that a lattice, it doesn't have a magical XYZ coordinate. There's no little um, vector coordinate system that's hidden between inside of each and every crystal that tells you this way's the X direction, this way's the Y, this way's the Z. Basically, we have to define that. We, the observer, are defining that coordinate system. And if I were to define it, maybe I would like to define it this way, but maybe someone else would have uh, E sub Y um, you know, pointing down and, and E sub Z pointing to the right. So there are different ways to define it that are all symmetrically equivalent. Um, when we think about the effect of measuring along different directions, we can think about it in terms of physically rotating the crystal, which is what I showed at the beginning of the video, but we can also think about it in terms of shifting and rotating that coordinate system. Um, so if I go back, it, let's say observer one defined this is their coordinate system. Observer two chose a totally equally valid coordinate system um, that follows the symmetry of the properties. So basically Neumann's rule um, is coming from this fact that um, because we don't have a predefined coordinate system, um, both this orientation uh, and this orientation should give the same results 
um, for measuring a property along, let's say, the red or the blue direction. Um, so in order to get there, we kind of need to talk about um, tensors. And, and tensors come from directional properties. Um, so we can think about non-directional properties. We think about this all the time. So for example, if I want to talk about the intrinsic property of a material and give an example that's non-directional, maybe I would talk about the density. I know that if I have, um, uh, let's say, uh, iron or lead, if I pick a particular material, the density is the intrinsic uh, property that relates mass to volume. But it, it doesn't relate at all to any directions. It doesn't matter... Um, how the material is oriented, I'm not measuring density along a particular direction. And so when we have non-directional properties like density, we use scalars to define them, just a simple number, a scalar. And that's different if we want to talk about directional properties. So for example, let's think about something like transport, something where we have um, something moving around in a material. So a good example would be electrical conductivity. I'm thinking about some kind of charge, electrons, or maybe holes moving around in the material. Um, so you're familiar with uh, V equals IR, Ohm's law. You've probably seen this in intro physics classes. Material scientists, we usually non-dimensionalize this. So we think about an electric field, a current density, and a resistivity. Um, so rho is an intrinsic material property that relates a field to a current density. Alternatively, I could have written this around where I'm thinking about a conductivity. Um, I just, you know, conductivity is one over resistivity. So if we bring resistivity to the other side, we get conductivity times electric field equals the current density. Um, now, the reason I want to bring this up is let's think about measuring this in different materials. And if I have a, you know, let's say I have a one meter cube of polycrystalline copper, um, does it measure, which, does it matter which direction I apply that electric field in. Would I get the same resistivity if I apply electric field horizontally uh, or, or across the body diagonal? Um, and if it's a random polycrystalline solid, this is an isotropic material. And so this, you would expect that the resistivity doesn't really matter um, uh, what orientation I measured in. Um, but let's think about something that is very anisotropic. Um, let's think about a material like, uh, like mica, that is a 2D, a layered material. And um, the same thing could be applied to graphite or any other layered material. I know I have very strong bonding in the plane, weaker bonding between the planes. Do you think resistivity would be the same if I'm measuring it horizontally or vertically? Uh, and the answer is no, it should not be. So this is where we can no longer describe the resistivity of this material using just a single scalar. Um, so, so this is where tensors have to come in. Um, and tensors are basically um, multi-dimensional arrays that are relating some material property that has some directionality to it to another material property. Um, so if I think about this again in terms of a current density um, it being related to conductivity times some electric field, uh, then I know that electric field could be represented as a vector. So it could have three different components that are um, telling me about the orientation that that electric field is applied. Uh, and similarly, current density could be described as a vector. So I could break it down into uh, current density along um, three principal component directions. Um, so if this is the case, if I want to relate uh, a, three, uh, a column vector with three elements to a column vector with three elements, I know that I need a three by three matrix to uh, relate these two things. And so this matrix, sigma sub ij, um, is what we call a rank two matrix, uh, a rank two tensor. Um, and a rank two tensor is just a fancy way to say a three by three array. Um, but you can see that I've gone from um, the case where I have just a simple scalar, I just have a single number, now conductivity actually has nine different components. Um, where we're going with this is that based on the symmetry of the material, these could be independent, or a lot of them could be dependent on each other and could reduce down to a much smaller number than nine. That's where we're going with Neumann's rule. We're trying to make our lives easier 
We're trying to avoid many, many elements to describe a tensor. Um, so I will tell you tensors get pretty complicated pretty quickly. Um, uh, you know, a rank zero tensor is another way to say a scalar. A rank one tensor is a three element vector. Um, so for example, uh, electric field uh, or current density are both rank one tensors. A second rank tensor relates to rank one tensors. So this is a three by three array, um, but we can scale up even further. So piezoelectric coefficients have to re re relate a first and a second rank tensor. And so in order to do that, you need a three by three by three array. Uh, that means 27 different elements. A fourth rank tensor, something that is gonna relate two second rate tensors. Stiffness and compliance are examples. So now we have 81 different elements. So um, if you get into the world of mechanics, you're gonna start thinking about fourth rank tensors. Um, we're gonna largely stick to first and second rank tensors for the purpose of discussion because they're a lot easier to wrap our head around, but just be aware that different properties need to have larger and larger tensors to describe them and describe the relationship between those properties. Um, so again, if I was talking about uh, conductivity, um, this only has nine elements, but um, uh, uh, stiffness or compliance matrix, these are fourth rank tensors, they have 81 different elements. So um, it's pretty complicated pretty quickly. Um, so let's come back to the goal at hand. The goal at hand is to relate symmetry of structure to the symmetry of properties. And the basic idea is that if a symmetry operation leaves the crystal invariant, then that same tensor has to be able to describe the property in original and transformed coordinate frames. And the effect is that this tends to place restrictions on some of these values of the tensor matrix. So no longer do I have nine independent values, I start to um, constrain them so I might have a far fewer number of independent values. And an extreme example would be a cubic system um, for a rank two tensor only has one independent parameter in it. So that's all we're gonna talk about here. Again, the next steps, I will um, show you a quick derivation that basically is, is doing the same thing that we say here, but using math. Uh, and then we'll apply Neumann's rule to a couple different properties.